Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our third and final day of Sports Photography Week with B&H. My name is Madeline, and I'm on the road marketing team. I am pleased to introduce today, joining us from New Jersey, Greg Palante, who is known for his commercial work. His clients include CityBike, Verizon, Billboard, GQ, and NARS Cosmetics, to name a few. Greg got into photography through his passion for punk rock and the snapshot aesthetic, although he has certainly made a name for himself in the sports photography world by photographing many famous athletes and working for the New Jersey Devils as one of their exclusive photographers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Greg. Greg, are you here with us? Awesome, I see you. Can you read me, Maddie? Hey, I, I gotcha. <laughs> I'm here. Good, you made Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. That was such a great intro. I appreciate that so much. And, no problem. Thank um, you so much for coming on. I only hoped it was a little longer to eat up some of my time. <laughs> I'm a little, little nervous about going for a whole hour here. <laughs> but I'm um, very excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, excited to get into, you know, what I do, why I do it, how I came to do it. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very excited to answer any questions anyone has, um, you know, like yeah, you said. Somebody will be here. So I, like I tell everybody almost every time, if they have any questions, they can put them in the chat. And then as you go through your images and present, um, I can, I can ask you those questions. So for those of you that are tuning in, whether you're on zoom or YouTube, please feel free to, um, drop your questions in the chat and we'll get to them <clears throat> as soon as we can. Um, and I've seen a, a good deal of your presentation. So I know a little bit about, you know, some of the images and I think you have a, a lot in store for these people. So you guys should definitely stay tuned. We're going to take a long journey here, Maddie. I hope you guys are, are prepared for that. Um, yeah, so I, I titled, let me start by saying I'm here in my studio. I'm in Jersey City, New Jersey, just a stone's throw over the Hudson um, in a building called Mana Contemporary, which is a building that's just full of artists and uh, a great place to visit if you haven't been here. Uh, really comes alive when they have their open houses and there's tons of artists here that you might have heard of or not heard of, but either way. They open all the doors and you can kind of just tour the whole building. It's really, it's really a, a great thing to take part in if you, if you are so inclined. Uh, it was canceled last year for obvious reasons, but this year I think it will, you know, it'll be happening again. So if you get a chance to come visit Maddie Contemporary, come say hi. Um, oh, should I screen share right now, May? Yeah, see if you can share, share your share. screen um, and I'll let you know how it's looking on my end. Okay, cool. There we go. There we go. Looks good. Are we full screen? We are. Cool. Okay. Let's go. So I titled the presentation Prep and Improv in Editorial Sports Photography. What exactly does that mean? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not really, you know, it's open to interpretation, but what I was getting at was being prepared uh, to be thrown into a situation where your entire plan gets thrown out and you sort of have to think on your feet. I think as a photographer, a lot of what we're doing is problem solving. Um, it's great to, obviously you wanna have a plan and you wanna have done a test and you wanna have, you know, but the most important thing is to know your equipment really well. I often say it's not important that you have all of the best equipment, but what is important is that you understand all of the equipment you have and know how to use it effectively. So we're gonna go back uh, I should start by saying that I'm not a sports photographer. I really appreciate you guys having me for sports week. And I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of sports images that I've shot in my career. Um, some of them very early in my career. And I'm going to explain how I got into that situation and how I got the shot that I got, whether or not it's, you know, the greatest shot of this particular athlete or not. Um, these are all instances where I came back with what I believe is the best image that I could get in that situation. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. And I'll try to show which gear I used at the time. Some of them, I don't remember what gear I used. Uh, some of them, I have some behind the scenes shots. Some of them, I don't. Um, 
But first, I want to give you an intro into my work and who I am. Um, it's sort of bold to get up here in Sports Week and say I'm not a sports photographer. But uh, so my name is Greg Palante. I'm a commercial editorial photographer. Um, I've worked with a lot. This is just a page straight out of my uh, dossier. Um, often a client will ask you to, you know, create a, a, an RFP, a proposal for something, and it helps on like the last page to show that you've worked with some notable clients. Um, and so this is a page out of that I thought would work here as I, as I put this thing together. Um, I'm going to show you some images uh, uh, with my personal style. This is something, some stuff that I've shot in my studio. Uh, some of it is brand work. Some of it is test shooting. Some of it is, is social media. Some of it is for commercial. But the point is to show that I have my own personal aesthetic. Uh, and my aesthetic, as Maddie sort of mentioned, is very much comes from my background in music. Uh, people often say there's like a grit or like a rock, a, a rock vibe. Um, and that may be because I grew up playing in punk bands. And you know, some of you who do know me may know me from, you may have no idea that I shoot any of this commercial work. You may know me from the guy who was on tour with your favorite New Jersey punk band when they were in, you know, Minneapolis. Um, Cause I've done that. I'm not showing any of that work though I maybe I should have thrown one or two in there but but it's not in there um that's totally for passion I I love shooting music but it hasn't made me a living <laughs> I'll show you what has made me a living and there are some some assignments that involve music we'll get to towards the end um but so uh just I'm just going to flip quickly through some examples of my work uh lifestyle work for a brand called Cremue uh this is like a beauty beauty shots done in my studio with uh, an amazing makeup artist named Eileen Halvagian. I want to shout her out because her work is amazing. Um, that's my friend Julia Mandriola, modeling. We've become friends because she's like an amazing model. Um, so you can see I get a little creative with some of this lighting, but for the most part, the images you're going to be seeing are very naturalist uh, lighting, very naturally lit. I sometimes get comments that people can't tell if it was natural light or strobe. And oftentimes that's kind of what I'm going for. It's, it's fun to get really creative with the light, but it's really, you know, a beneficial skill to be able to recreate a natural light, especially in commercial work or something where it's really important that your colors are accurate. Um, yeah, again, some, some personal work. Uh, okay, so here's an example of a, a social media campaign that I did with Sets and Hats, uh, where they sponsored my wife and I driving across country on our honeymoon. This was a dream job. Uh, I often get positive feedback, which is why I'm showing these images. Um, my wife despises being photographed, so this was a true feat, uh, getting her to pull over on the middle of the highway in Texas and, and pose for the camera you know, with the, with the hat, the box full of hats we had in the back, uh, picking one out. It was it was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. And uh, it was amazing. The images were for social and then they were subsequently licensed for the 2017 catalog. Um, it, it was just, you know, something that I often get positive feedback on. So to give you an idea of how my aesthetic has lent itself to, you know, more commercial lifestyle work. Uh, there we are. This doubled a as a uh, a an, uh, commercial image, and it also was our save the date or our thank you card for our wedding. So you can get more than one use out of it. You know, the more the merrier. Okay. Uh, now we're getting into some more commercial work. This is for Con Air Skin C. Um, these are the accessories in this woman's hair. She is a uh, what do you, an influencer, if you will. They did a partnership with different influencers. And these images were used to promote this line in Walgreens and, uh, you know, all over the place. So great day shooting for Con Air this was. And then it, it turned into, oh, I can also do product photography. A separate day they called me in to do, to do product photography um, in the studio. So just to give you like an idea of my experience, here's another example of commercial work. 
uh, for Theraflu. The irony of this flu test kit being that this shoot happened, uh, this shoot was probably happened, it happened in 2020, I want to say in January or February. Um, and I don't think they sold many flu tests because I think every, the flu kind of died down because everybody was worried about, you know, other things. Um, but great day on set. And I will say, uh, just a note, here's an example where we needed it to look like it was early morning. Uh, she was breathing in this, uh, this mixture that they, that they made. And so we put a light outside and lit the trees. So it looked like it was this nice morning glow. Um, yeah. Uh, so I apologize if I'm saying uh, a lot that happens. So we'll move on from there. Here's, here's some more uh, work for music industry. This is a, a band called Gates and was tapped by their record label at the time to produce some images for their upcoming release, which was called Parallel Lives. The actual concept, which this is all done in camera, these are lights attached to a C-stand and an extremely long exposure in the dark where I am personally walking the light stand in between the guys and then coming back and popping the flash at the end. Um, I don't know if that's the technical information you guys need, but that's what you're getting. Uh, so, all right. So let's see, where are we at on my, in my presentation? Oh, this is some more recent work for, for the Asbury Park Football Club, the only club that matters. I have to shout them out. They're all-star, Jared Hart, giving us the hard stance in the studio. Beautiful. Uh, so now we're getting into more sports stuff. This, personal work, but I'm, I'm kind of trying to transition into sports because I'm so far away from it. So we're going to get into these, these professional athletes that I shot and how I did that sort of really, very early in my career. But why would anyone, why would anyone trust me to do that? Um, like one of the first, one of the first assignments I had, which we're going to get into very soon was a CC Sabathia. Um, and he even like his rookie season. And I was probably three years out of college when, you know, I was given that shoot. And why? Why would anyone entrust me to do that shoot? So I graduated college and I sort of had the opinion that I didn't want to assist anyone. Now, whether that was a good move or not, I was interested in being a newspaper photographer at the time and I just wanted to shoot. So I, I literally started, I walked into a local newspaper office and I just said, I'll shoot anything. Now, granted, I, I had just bought my first digital camera. I went to school. I went to a state school that didn't have digital cameras. Now this is, um, date, date myself, but it's 2000 and I want to say 2005. Um, so learned on all film and in school. And when I got out, I had to learn how to shoot digital in order to shoot the types of things that I want to shoot. So I, I go into a local newspaper office and just say, I want to shoot. They offer me $25, an assignment. First assignment, go shoot an egg hunt in the park for Easter. Uh, and I did that. Images were printed uh, in color in the newspaper that weekend. And, and I was hooked at, at seeing my images in print. Um, that company then had an opening for a photographer for a new specialty publication. It was like a youth market thing. Uh, that was a, so I didn't get the job. Very bummed. Went to Europe for like two weeks with my buddy, Scott. Uh, and on the way back, get the call. The guy who took the job doesn't want the job. You want the job. Uh, great. And then the lesson there is like, just don't sit around and wait for anything to happen. If one thing's not working out, just go out and do something else. And either they'll come back calling or they won't, but at least you've already occupied your time, you know, uh, and you've already, you're already working on something else. So, so I got that job. And it was for a publication called Exit, which was a New Jersey, New Jersey lifestyle um, youth. I mean, I was going to clubs. I was shooting uh, local bands. I was shooting, you know, we were illustrating stories about uh, a local fashion designer, really just kind of like pulling, pulling content out of thin air sometimes because it was a weekly and we were a, a staff of like 15 people. <laughs> and I had no peers. I, I was the entire photography department. Um, so, so from there, I was tapped by that same company. They saw some promise in me, and they and they brought me up to the specialty publications division, which produced 
a bunch of lifestyle magazines for some of the more wealthy towns in New Jersey. Um, they have a, a big one called 201 Magazine, which is a Bergen County magazine. And this is the publisher of the record. It's called North Jersey Media Group, subsequently bought out by USA Today, which may or may not be Gannett. I'm not really sure. But regardless, at some point, somebody, they decided they wanted to do a sports magazine. They wanted to photograph high school kids, high school athletes uh, for a full color glossy magazine. Um, and I was asked if I wanted to do any of these shoots. And of course, so I'm meeting up with these high school kids and I could come back with the, the kid with the ball under his arm smiling and it probably would have been okay. But I was really sort of trying to get something that they weren't expecting. Um, you know, at this point, I think my, my kit was a couple of Nikon flash guns and like a D1 X or something. I'm not a huge tech guy. So if I'm, I got the dates wrong on the number of the Nikon cameras that I had, I, I apologize. But um, so the whole point of this magazine was to just, you know, get these, get cool shots of these, of these high school kids. And it ended up being something that I really learned a lot from because A, it was a full color glossy magazine. So seeing your pictures come out on a full page when you're just like two years out of college, um, was just, you know, there's something really great about that. And I, I learned about sort of framing images in a way so that they worked on a page. Um, these kids were, you know, I, say I walked into, say my first shoot was on a NBA court and I said, hey, what if you jump over, this guy jumps over this guy, like, and I had no credentials, they would laugh me out of the auditorium. But these kids were totally cool to, to try anything, like as long as I, they didn't get hurt. Like they could pretty much do anything I asked them to do. Um, that is to say, I shot action as well, like, but it was more of a staged editorial type of action, as you can see, where I could ask this kid to go run down there and, and dive back here and and uh, and do it five more times till I get the shot right. You know, and I, this is like 2007 that we're doing this. So, yeah. Again, I'll just show a few more. Uh, something notable about this one is that I was learning, you know, to really control my lighting where um, these both kind of have the same vibe and the same, I mean, it's not the same lighting, obviously, but it's the same mood in a sense. And one is lit totally with the, the window light and one is lit totally with my, my strobes that I was carrying around. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, okay. From there, we're going to get right into... <clears throat> this is the first professional athlete I ever shot, CC Sabathia, in 2009. Um, so the people at the company that I was working for were happy with what I was doing at the sports magazine. <clears throat> and we had this opportunity to shoot this, you know, up and coming pitcher on the Yankees. And uh, we were, te I was teamed up with a, a well-known sports writer named um, Bob Clappish. He's written for the New York Times. Uh, he, I think he might be at the Star Ledger now. I'm not 100% sure, but just a, a really great guy. I was teamed up with him for a lot of these images you're going to see. Um, now, this sort of appears like it was shot in the studio. It was not. It was shot on the field. <clears throat> um, pretty simply, I, I, I believe it was two strobes. One had like a bounce back umbrella with a diffuser. Uh, that was the key. And then we had another light i think with an umbrella it might have been a grid i don't have it behind the scenes to tell me all the information this was a long time ago but i think we had another light off behind him that just gives that little bit of rim on his cheek there um and you know we were on the field again there was no discussion about how we wanted him posed or positioned or anything like that uh like here's an image of bob bob and cc talking in the dugout that i that i picked up um, I'm going to try and let you guys take it in. I, I seem to fill in all the, all the space with this, this speech and I'm going to just let you guys take in the image a little bit. Um, so here's a nice smiling picture of CC. Something about it, you know, it, it would have worked. My editor probably would have been like, great. Uh, but there was something to me as I was shooting him 
about his silhouette uh, as a, as a guy with ears that stick out. Myself, I I saw that you know I was thinking about you know the Jordan silhouette or something and how you can you can tell it's Jordan uh, you know and trying to get something you know iconic. I didn't know CC would be necessarily become who he became. He was already already a big deal, but but uh, you know now he's he's larger than life. So I just asked him to put you know I'll go back. I asked him to put the mitt up over the over his face and. Uh, I just for some reason seemed like a bit more of a powerful image. Uh, I think it drove the copy to where they, the headline ran. It was something like, guess who's coming to town? I'll, I'll show an image of it in a minute. But just to show you that it wasn't entirely a creative decision, here's a, my assistant that day was Mr. Joram Mushinsky, a designer extraordinaire. I just want to shout him out. And you can see that this was done in the middle of, of practice. I had like five minutes of CC which is actually amazing, a come to find. But uh, we didn't really have, you know, we didn't really have, we couldn't show the rest of the field. So my only option was to shoot. If I wanted him on the field at Yankee Stadium, my only option was to sort of crop it in a way where you could still tell it was Yankee Stadium. And what ended up being the cover of the magazine was this shot right here. Pretty much the same shot, except I kind of angled it down a little bit so that you could tell where he was you know, just subtly, and it gives it a little more, a little more color as well. You got one comment, Greg, you got from YouTube, JDH, great work, Greg. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. To throw um, that in there. You're doing cool. great on time too, so. Great. Thanks for the update. <laughs> so this no was problem. the cover as it, this was the cover as it ran. Um, this is, I could, I don't have an image of the, of the cover. This is how it ran on, uh, you know, I just pulled it off the website. Here's like an alternate shot we got. Again, there were people in the stands. So my only option was sort of to, uh, to angle upward and crop it out. And, you know, we got truly blessed on CC's arm, which just ended up being an added bonus. Uh, subsequently had the opportunity to photograph CC a couple of other times and he was always totally gracious and cool. So I'm definitely taking too much time. I'm going to try and go quicker. This is his wife, Amber. Okay. So here's Don Madden in 2011. Uh, now this image looks like it might've been shot in the same, same sort of setup. And that's not an accident. That's what I was going for, but truth be told, um, I was sort of spoiled by the CC shoot where I was expecting that. And uh, when I got there, I kind of, I walked into a situation like this where when Don came out, it was a big story. Don was back in the New York area after, you know, not being here for a while. And now he's coaching the Dodgers at City Field. Um, so it's a media swarm. And I'm worried that I'm not going to get a shot that I can bring home to my editor that's going to run the full page like we needed to. Um, this was my assistant that day a great photographer, Anne-Marie Caruso. She's not gonna appreciate me using this image, but I just wanted to show you that this was the light that we used and she had it on a monopod and she was helping me out that day. So it's just a, a Canon 580EX2, I believe, on a, on a monopod with a little diffuser. Um, so as I see that what's going on, I sort of said, and go outside the dugout. Let's try and he's not going to come out here. There's no way we're going to meet up with him. Let's try and just get some good lighting on what he is. So she's outside of the dugout and I'm sort of trying to weasel my way into the dugout. I'm getting closer. It looks like the light is, is, is falling. Okay. And there's, there's Clappish right there. He's, uh, he's getting his interview and I'm freaking out because he's my only link here. He, he, he's the one who knows Don and he's going to ask Don if he'll look at me for a shot or two. And I'm totally not in position. So, so I'm trying to get in a position, but I'm still not quite there. And Clappish is almost done uh, interviewing. And I'm again, still freaking out. And I'm saying, and move over. And is standing outside of the dugout. I'm clearly in the dugout. And then I got into this position where it kind of seems like I might have a shot. The light is not terrible. But the one last leap of faith I had to take was to kind of say, hey, guys, do you mind moving back just for one shot? Would, 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 hey, all the, all the, uh, if you can see behind this guy's tape recorder, there's a hand right there. That's the only guy who did not listen to my, to, to my plea. Everyone else moved away. 
and I got this this shot, which appears to be a staged, uh, you know, setup shot. Um, that hand was the only thing I photoshopped out of the background. Um, but other than that, you know, a successful image that my my editor at the time was was totally cool with, happy about. So yeah, we'll move on from there. This and then Keith Olbermann was in the dugout too, so I took a shot of him as well. This is uh, Luis Robles, who is a he was a goalie on the the Red Bulls. This was shot on the field at at the Red Bull Stadium in Harrison. Um, you know, a nice action shot. He was down to to play. He uh, you know allowed he did a whole bunch of jumps for me. But it, it started with the whole concept was we started in the suite to get like these GQ style photos. Um, and I'll show you the setup there. We just went into a suite, set up a set up a backdrop, a couple of lights. At this time, I believe I'm using my Paul Buff Alien Bees with a, with a soft box or two. Um, you know, and so we got that image, not the most compelling image, but kind of conveys that 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 uh, the lifestyle we're going for in these magazines are very much about where this person lives and welcome to town and the readers are, you know, people who get these magazines like delivered to their house, a lot of real estate and doctor's offices are advertising, things like that. Um, we broke for lunch and I kind of said, hey, Luis, what's your favorite pizzeria in, in, in town, you know? Um, and we got to talk about that. It was only natural to get a nice shot of him with the, with the, uh, with the pizza. And that to me just added like a level to the, to the shoot that we didn't have before. Again, the whole idea here being loose and, and being open to changes and, and rolling with it as, it go, as you're going along, uh, talking to your subject, uh, learning about them as you shoot or before you shoot and being prepared when you walk in to, to call an audible when necessary, you know? And uh, sometimes you get something a little, a little different than what anybody else might have got. That's it. Um, we went down to change to do the field shot and got some nice shots of him in the locker room, which I, these might be my favorite images from the shoot. It seems like a little more intimate, um, behind the scenes kind of vibe. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna move on from there to, I got a lot of stuff in here, so I don't think I'm taking too long. I'm gonna go a little quicker. If anyone has any questions on any of these, feel free to interject. Um, Steve Weatherford, he's the kicker for the New York Giants. Uh, this was shot in 2014. Uh, again, the initial idea was to shoot him on a nice backdrop, you know, with a white background, with a cool, you know, and I'll show you, here's where we started the shoot. Um, you know, he's a very attractive guy, that helps a lot. And for a natural light, natural light vibe, um, there's Joram again. And here's my the only shot I had that was behind the scenes to show you kind of where we were at a gym uh, in I want to say it's on Route 17. I don't remember exactly which township it was, but a, a gym that the a rehab center that the that the Giants use. And uh, I just found a nice white wall there with a nice window light coming in and a nice fill from this from this um, beauty dish. Um, you know, when you're dealing with uh, Someone like Steve Weatherford, you don't need to do a whole lot to get a, a nice shot of him. But uh, so as we're moving along, Steve was was totally chill. He's the only reason I'm showing this image. You know, he stopped to take a picture with somebody in the gym who recognized him. And you'll see behind him, there's like a blue wall there. So in my head, I wasn't totally sold on the on the the white backdrop shot really being our our cover to the magazine. So I quickly set up some lighting. Uh, did like a little ring behind him and a soft box off the side and had a little fun with it, with the ring. Uh, I got a shot with the ring in focus, shot with the, with his face in focus. Not sure which one we would end up going with, but they ended up photoshopping the two together. So the, so the, uh, the final image, which was totally unplanned was this image of Steve showing off his ring. You know, he's a, he's a big personality. If you're familiar with Steve. The smile definitely works for him. So, yeah, then, then we, got, we got a little creative where I could tell the, uh, the stylist on set was not opposed to Steve getting in the pool. Um, sort of had to ask Steve if he had brought his trunks. And, you know, he's not a shy guy either. So set up for this shot, you know, with that nice, the glisten. Again, a lot of this is not planned. 
and we're just sort of rolling with it. And knowing your, your gear and what you are prepared to do as you are moving through the shoot is really important. Um, I haven't really talked about gear at all. I mostly shoot with Canon cameras. Um, at this time, I might've been on like a 7D. I'm now, I just bought an R, uh, moving away from my 5D Mark IV. And the R is giving me some issues, which if anyone from Canon is, is, uh, is listening, I would love to discuss this glitch that I have, which no one can answer for me. Um, where the, the camera resets the date every time I shut the camera off. And yes, I have updated the firmware numerous times. Uh, and that's, it's, a, it's a nightmare in terms of workflow. So if anyone from Canon is listening, I would love to speak to you about this, this glitch in my, in my EOS R, especially before I end up buying an OS 5. So, all right. Okay, Robinson Cano at the field, on the field at Yankee Stadium. Um, so, this is the, the this was my my favorite image from from this shoot. Similar situation uh, to CC, and this is the image they ended up running on their cover. And I'll tell you the motivation for this shoot was this poster of Mickey Mantle that I had on my wall as a child that my my dad hung up there. And my dad, I think the only time I've ever seen my dad cry was the day Mickey Mantle died. So uh, I was very it, it meant a lot to him. I, I think it ended up in our like basement uh like sort of game room and it was there for a very long time this poster now in my head it was it was it was mickey's back with the seven and light shining in and, and this image was like burned into my memory as i you know walked onto the field on a nice partly cloudy day at the stadium um but I, when i actually searched for the the image this was the image of the this was the actual poster um this isn't the one we had when we had wasn't wasn't signed by Mickey Mantle, but it, it's actually not that wasn't the image, but it didn't really matter because, you know, what what I ended up going for worked out uh, a little behind the scenes of that shoot. I, I had two cannon flashes. On on a stand with the radio popper at the time, again, stuff all over the field. So that wasn't really an option shooting on the field. Um, lest we let on that we weren't that important. Uh, but more or less got some, got some decent images, uh, Robinson Cano, that I was proud to put in my portfolio. And that's a, another important thing too. A lot, a lot of these images didn't run. They, um, it's really important that you're shooting for yourself. A lot of young photographers can get really frustrated if they take an image that they think is is like the image and then when they submit they find out that the editor chose chose like a totally different image that they never would have chose now some people say then you don't give those images to your editor but in this in this job that i had the sensibility of the magazine was a lot different than my own personal taste so whereas i was going to be like hard uh sports images that you know made these guys look tough and tall and, and uh, you know dominant. The magazine really was going for the image that said, "This is your neighbor, and, and he's like a nice, he's a nice guy, and and we're all you know we're all together." Um, so, yeah, that's just a tip. Always shoot for yourself at the same time. Like once you get the image, you know I know a lot. I know it's nothing new, but get get that safe image and then get creative as much as you can. Like these shoots. I don't, I don't end them. I never ended them early. You know, it was pretty much shooting and, and doing everything you can until like, you know, the handler comes over and says that he's got to go, which is totally cool. Um, you know, you can get the vibe from the person if it's going on long and they, and they want to wrap it up. Um, it's Willie Randolph. This one, this image I get asked about a lot uh, by a lot of people, mostly by my man, Andy Diamond. Um, who is obsessed with Willie Randolph. So this was a shoot we did at his house. Um, this ended up, I think, being the image that ran like half page in the magazine. Willie was, was very gracious and welcoming. We did some portraits on a white backdrop as well. 
this was you know outside of a window or right right next to a window so we used that natural light i think i was also bouncing a flash off of the ceiling behind him which i you know you learn you live and you learn i don't think i even would have done that gives that little bit of glare on the top of his head over here um i don't even think that's necessary here's me shooting with my my hasselblad a little behind the scenes really was totally totally cool and again we there's very much focused on like you know welcome 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 to willie's house you know and and i will say willie had a lot of interesting things in his home a lot of artifacts uh his mickey mantle ball that i i couldn't help but take a picture of uh you know smeared trophy case as he was showing us around some homemade wine from willie this is just a little uh little behind the scenes from that shoot there there's this bar here's here's a example of when to check your uh your reflections because there's my my gridded sauce box in the, in the window back there now, this image might have worked if not for that so you know all right odell beckham jr 2015. Uh, this was shot at the new york yankees uh, the new york giants practice facility in the meadowlands um Odell, you know, is like everything you want in a subject. Like, came in, was was totally gracious, shook everybody's hand. Uh, a lot of people ask me how he was. They think maybe he might have been like, uh, you know, too big for his britches. That was not my experience at all. Gave us pretty much all the time we needed. Um, it was lit pretty simply. Created, I think, probably a gridded softbox. I think I have a behind the scenes image here as well. Uh, this is the image that ran on the cover. You know, again, a little light, lighthearted for for my sensibilities. A great picture of, of Odell. But um, what happened afterwards was I ended up getting contact. I uh, I got contacted by the editor at GQ Magazine, a photo editor uh, who was interested in license. She, she said, "Can you send us? Can you send us more images? Do you have any other images from the shoot?" Um, to which I responded, sure, and, and, and put together a little collection of images from the shoot, which she then asked to, to license. Uh, I think they, li they licensed this image, which was actually shot with the Hasselblad. So that was shot on black and white film. And that's the one they went with, which was, which was really cool because I often shoot digitals and film at the same time. I uh, find the film really slows down the whole process. Uh, the moments are a little more precious. It commands more respect from your subject. Um, I've done shoots with with bands where, you know, they, they, it's very hard for bands to take themselves seriously, uh, but they really need to for those promo photos and where they're goofing off for an hour. And then, you know, I'm not really sure we got the image we want. But when I pull out that that Hasselblad, um, everyone kind of stops to take notice. And, and when I tell them we only have 12 frames on this, they're like, well, oh, oh, you know, they, they uh, sort of fall in line and, and uh, pay more attention. So, yeah, so that ended up being licensed by GQ. Now, oh, I wanted to, this is Justin Tuck. This was a year or so earlier. He's a, a linebacker on the Giants. Um, we shot this in the same place, but for this, we had set up on the field at the practice facility, um, but it wasn't full body. They actually ended up... Uh, they ended up running an image which showed that he wasn't wearing, you know, nice pants. He was wearing like jeans or something. They just thought it was clever, so they ran it. Um, but I, this is to say, as I was setting up the backdrop for the Odell Beckham shoot, I realized that the turf was was causing a problem. That like this needed to be full body. It was it was it had to do with fashion that we dressed him in a bunch of different outfits. Uh, Heather Wayne, stylist, uh, dressed him in a bunch of different outfits, and it, we needed full body shots. And uh, the seamless on the turf was just ripping or, or you know, it was, it was getting damaged. So I ended up like five minutes before he gets there, decide we need to move the whole setup into the porch, like this area between the, uh, between the front door and the door where you walk into the actual field. Um, like I said, I think we took him a little by surprise when he walked in. Uh, and there, there's that image as I was taking it. Again, a guy you can just, you can just sort of 
turn a camera on him and turn him loose. And he was cool. I often like to ask people what kind of music they want to listen to when we're shooting. And uh, yeah, he definitely got into it, which was, which was a lot of fun. That's one of my favorite images from the shoot. Well, there's like a behind the scenes. Greg, we have two questions if you want to sure. take them now. Sure. What do you got? Um, we have a question from Andrew. Greg, how many photos are in the edit you submit from a shoot? And how many do you shoot to edit down from? Thank you. Great photos. Um, how many do I submit? Now, it depends on the publication uh, and the client specifically. I think some clients expect more than other clients. I appreciate sort of like a working relationship where it, it, maybe it comes from my working as a commercial photographer, but I really want my client to be happy. Whereas I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, that not every photographer doesn't want that, but um, I, I like to send a big edit so that we can both kind of like, it's like sending contact sheets. We can, we can sort of look through them and circle the ones that we both like. And then I'll pare down from there. It's also a matter of really fine tuning a few images and not wanting to do that to like hundreds of images. So if I can send a large edit, uh, you know, with a watermark and, and or, or very small files and have the client, you know, look through them, note the ones that I really like um, and then have them note the ones that they really like. I, I often will go somewhere, like if we both select like say we both select 25 images that we absolutely love from this shoot and then the crossover is 10 images, then I'm really going to spend a lot of time on those 10 images. Um, you know, so like, for example, with when GQ called and wanted to see images from this shoot, I did not send the, I think I, sh I probably shot like 500 images on the shoot in a matter of like 10 minutes. And that's, that's an overestimation. Maybe maybe 400. I really don't remember, but um, I didn't send her that many. I really, that's a situation where someone's licensing an image. I'll really, really pared it down to like 20 and said, here you go. What, what do you think out of this? You know? Um, and then she asked me if I could edit like two images. It was down to like these two images, but we definitely want one. Cool. Spent, spent time editing those two images. So they were, they were just right. You know? Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question or not. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's good. Um, we do have another question on a okay. similar sort of topic, um, from sports majors, LLC, if possible, can Greg talk settings on shoots? Uh, you know, I would really need to pull, I use strobes a lot, right? So, uh, I'm really, you know, what my shutter speed is, if you're a photographer, you know, doesn't matter as much if you're shooting in strobe. Uh, I mean, it matters if you get it wrong, but if you get it right, <laughs> and unless you're, you're blending in with the background, like if I'm shooting on a, on a backdrop like this, all of my light is coming from my strobes. So my aperture really matters, right? And my settings on my, on my lights really matter. But as long as my shutter speed isn't too fast uh, or isn't too slow, I guess that, that means it matters, huh? <laughs> but that's to say it hovers, it hovers somewhere, you know, in the middle. Uh, I guess. What's a good starting point for you? Like when you're going into a shoot, where do you sort of start? Like I know when I shoot a lot of times with lights, I'll shoot at a certain ISO. Do you have a certain sh like starting point, go to aperture? Like, do you like shooting wide open? Talk a little bit about your technique there. I think it really depends on the image. Like if I'm shooting someone on a backdrop like this, you know, and it's something that I know is going to be in print. I think coming, coming from the age, the age that I am, I grew up shooting film. And when I got a digital camera, the high ISOs were not that great as they are now. Like the cameras now are so forgiving. And that's, that's awesome. You can shoot in like darkness with some of these like Sony cameras and stuff. But like the school that I come from, the higher your ISO is, like the higher quality the image is. So I'm trying to keep the ISO as high as I can and have as much light as possible. You know, if I choose 
that uh, so you know so I'm trying to keep in something like this the aperture is probably pretty high too. Uh, now if I'm shooting and and I want the background to fall out, then we got to make some changes. You know if if I want to have some bokeh or whatever you want to call it, um, obviously we need less light and we need to change the aperture. Um, I, so when you're asking if I have like a go-to, I really I mean it's probably it's probably starting somewhere around f8 at like 120 fifth of a second or something you know it's uh it's pretty basic because i'm most of the time controlling the light and, and i think in my work it's more so getting in something like this where i'm in the studio obviously there's no background light but in a lot of a lot of situations the goal is to have the background light and the strobes converge uh, i think uh jc had said something yesterday about how you're actually shooting two exposures where you're you know the background exposure and the foreground exposure and that's 100 percent true and if you don't understand if you can't get the light in front of the subject to match the light behind the subject you're going to have problems you know um again problem solving just knowing your equipment like seeing the image i think a, a frustrating thing as a young photographer is that you start to be able to see an image like in front of you but you can't really get it like on the film frame you know what i mean so that's where the technical stuff comes in where in the moment you have to know how to how to do that like if you need that light to, if you need to have less light so that you can control the aperture you know then that's what you need to do um i don't know if i'm again am i answering the question or not i i really try to stay loose i know that's sort of like my topic i i'm not going in with like this preconceived notion that it, it needs to be you know f18 uh for it to be to be good you know um for everything's got to be in focus it has to be like totally totally crisp like no because you know in the moment i may realize that i want like a tight shot of of odell's hair but you know but i want like his chin beneath it to be out of focus or something um and to me it's more like understanding the difference and understanding the gear that you have um like here's an example this is an image that i love from the shoot but it's you know, it's, it's my flash didn't fire, you know, on the hustle blog. It's got, it's got dust all over it. And that can be cool too, you know. Um, and his chain kind of pops out of the background. It's different. I shot, I shot these Polaroids at the same time. Uh, Polaroid was over to the side. And every time we changed an outfit, I'd just be like, you know, I didn't even, I didn't ask him to pick up the, the stool. We were just, we were just, we were vibing, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, and I think if I was too controlled, if I was too too locked into what needed to be done, um, I knew I had I knew I had it in the can, you know. I knew I had I knew I had the the shot that I needed for my cover, and therefore I was able to just play, you know. And that's to me and my photography is really important. Um, again, I don't know if I answered the question. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move. You can obviously jump in, but I'm going to move through these a little bit faster because I'm. This is Brad Sims. He's a, he's a professional BMX rider. Um, and this was a situation where I have a friend who owns a BMX company and we were just, we were hanging out. Brad was sleeping on his couch. Um, and he just kind of said, you know, and this, if you follow this guy, if you have any, his name is Brad Sims. He's an amazing rider. He doesn't like attempt to do things. He just decides he's going to do things and he'll jump off in the parking garage. It's insane. I don't have great photos of him riding. This was just, we were hanging out and uh, he was still in town. And he saw I had a music studio and the guy next door to my studio was raising snakes in his music studio and his like, you know, warehouse that he had in Clifton. And and uh, Brad saw this and, and said, hey, I'm afraid of snakes. That's my only fear. And he's the type of guy who that meant he wants to he wants to meet snakes. Right. So we so we met up. I said, cool, let's go take some photos. Got this big boa around his neck. Uh, he was scared, but, you know, he went through with it and it ended up being licensed for a BMX company. Um, so, yeah, so that was cool. <laughs> That's just another example of, of being, you know, being open, continue working. Uh, there's the other owner of the company that we'll move on from there. Um, all right, this is an Olympic fencer. Uh, her name is Maya Lawrence. This was 2012. Photographed in her living room on a black backdrop. 
here's the behind the scenes of my attempts to be creative on this one. This was like, you know, the slice of pizza or the, you know, whatever. And they say, hey, I have, a, I have a lightsaber. I'm obsessed with Star Wars. What if uh, you're holding a lightsaber? Didn't work. Didn't work at all. But you know what? I already had the, uh, I already had the image and we had a good laugh about it. So it was a good time. <laughs> Kept it loose and uh, Maya's awesome. Rob Kaminsky, he at the time, I think had just been drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals. He said, okay, we're moving through the, the sports world. I'm definitely going to have to end soon, and I want to get to some other stuff. So, uh, on the town case, Brandon Jacobs, 2011, in his car, Ilya Kovlicek of the Devils. Um, this is a funny one because here's the only manipulation. We had to get those jock straps out of there. See that? That couldn't work. That was just taking, it was too real, too real. Get the jock straps out of there. Okay. So moving along, I now, I shoot for the New Jersey Devils fairly often. Um, I live very close to the stadium. I, I met them a couple of years ago. A friend of mine said they're looking for a photographer and met them. And, and the, the thing that I shoot the least is action sports. Most of the time they're calling me in to shoot portraits. Uh, or I'll show you a bunch of things that we shoot. Just this, the point of this is to tell you that if you want to shoot sports, you don't necessarily have to shoot action. Um, these are, they do a media day where they're basically just compiling images of the players to go up on their jumbotron or to use in promotions. Um, you know, so you just have a few minutes and here we're, we're marketing, we're marketing the, the apparel that Travis is wearing. Um, Nico Heizer rocking the new, you know, 2018 New Jersey Devils gear. Okay, and aside from the players, a lot of things happen at a at a at a stadium. Uh, this young man came out, skated out to the uh, the national anthem with the Devils on his sled. Didn't have the use of his legs. Truly inspiring little man. I can't remember his name. Threw this together kind of quickly, so I apologize. But again, to show you, there's a lot of things that happen around the professional sports team it's not all necessarily about the action like this these are you know there's a lot of culture happening there's a lot of like images of the fans arriving at the stadium uh these are all things that i've shot for the devils this is the prudential center itself um i had the opportunity to shoot the lawler versus covington usc match um I'm going to try and not speak through everything, but I'm running out of time. So I'm going to try and go a little bit quicker. Uh, concerts happen at the Prudential Center. These, you know, the checks say New Jersey Devils on them, but the Devils, you know, they own the Prudential Center and they'll call me in for a lot of different things. Cardi B, at the Prudential, Funkmaster Flex, Chris Brown. This was the most recent concert I shot there was Post Malone. Uh, right before things kind of got shut down. And beyond concerts, they have a Grammy Museum there. Um, this was a Whitney Houston exhibit. I'm running out of time. I'm going to go, I'm going to flip through these a little bit. Uh, this is one of my favorite things that I shoot there. Again, not sports, but for a sports organization. Uh, these are these Angelique Kidjo, Kate Tempest. These are these, these Grammy nominated uh, artists performing. This is Laos. He's a pop artist performing in the Grammy Museum, small, intimate crowd. They also have me shoot um, these promotions for beverages and food, things that you would never think you would get hired to do to shoot for the New Jersey Devils. Um, the collaboration with Labatt Blue on the ice with my Pro Photo B1 kit. That's, by the way, if you're asking gear, the Pro Photo B1 location kit is, is my favorite piece of equipment. I know you didn't ask, but um, I do need to get a B1X kit, but currently have the B1 uh, Pro Photo. Reach out to me. Um, yeah, pretzels that look like devils. You know, what else do you need? This is just to show you. It's I shot the Pride Parade last year for the New Jersey Devils. You would never think that's something that you would be shooting for a sports organization, but. You know, keep in mind, it, there's something that can be said about being a quote unquote jack of all trades photographer. Maybe that's not the best route to take. It kind of chose me. People ask me to do all kinds of things. If I'm confident I can do them, I say, yeah, let's, let's go for it. And, uh, you know, and then they keep calling. So why not? I love new experiences. 
Uh, oh, so we're getting into where I'm at now and moving forward. And I hope I didn't shy too far away from the sports thing. And I want to talk about this new project I'm working on. It's called CNO, F-E-E slash K-N-O-W, um, launching July 1st from the publisher of Slam Magazine, uh, Dennis Page, publisher of Slam Magazine, and uh, a friend of mine named Eric Kano got together and they're tackling streetwear and fashion. I tapped me to be the, the in-house photographer for this. So a few days a week, I am shooting with them. It's all streetwear and fashion based. Again, Dennis is, he is basketball. He lives and breathes basketball, but this, he also published Revolver Magazine and Double XL Magazine. Um, and these are some of the shoots. These haven't been dropped yet. But like I said, it's launching on July 1st. And I just wanted to give sort of an idea on where I'm moving from, from here. Uh, obviously still open to shooting sports and commercial and lifestyle and everything that comes my way. This is sort of my, uh, sort of where, what I'm doing right now. And I thought it sort of tied in with sports week because it is with the publisher of a, of a well-known basketball magazine. Um, and the, Insta the Instagram account is live. We're currently doing a look back at streetwear history, um, profiling fashion designers like Sean Stussy and Mark Jacobs, uh, brands like Cross Colors and kind of showing our goal is to break emerging streetwear brands. So who is the next, who is the next Nego? Who's the next, you know, um, I'm drawing blanks. <laughs> but just to give you an idea where I'm moving from here, and I really thank you guys for sticking with me. I know it wasn't a lot of technical information. And I know, um, I hope I answered your questions. I know I'm, I ramble a lot. Um, and I know there should be a lot of technical talk being as how this is b &H. But, uh, you know, I know my gear. I research before I buy a certain piece of gear. I research like crazy. Then I buy that gear. And then I sort of turn off everything else when I focus on how to use it, I read the manual, I get really immersed in, you know, the gear that I'm using until I need to buy something else, at which point I start doing research again. So that's kind of my take on, on the, you know, how to, on gear and whatnot. Um, happy to answer any other questions you guys have. Email me, follow me on Instagram at Greg Palante. And I'm really happy to answer any questions you have. Apologize if I did not answer them in this, but we're uh, we're reaching our, our deadline awesome. here, Maddie. So <laughs> sorry if I if I didn't job. let you get a word in. <laughs> no, you're all set. Um, we're gonna have you, uh, the BNH rep drop your website and your Instagram in the chat. So make sure you check out Greg's work and follow him on Instagram. And also, being that you are a pro photo user, I just want to remind everybody that we are offering a pro photo deal right now. Um, we have 5% off all the pro photo A10 studio flashes, as well as the B10s and B10 pluses. Um, you have to use the code BH Sports Pro Photo at checkout. So make sure you do that. And if you have any issues, you can feel free to email my team at bhshows at bhphoto.com. We'll, we usually get back to you within 24 hours or so. That also goes for technical questions if those come up. And thank you so much to Greg. That was a great and very informative. Thank you, Maddie. And awesome. One more thing. Thank happy you. birthday, Sam and Owen. My twin boys turned three on Saturday. So happy birthday, oh, happy guys. Happy birthday. Thank you guys for having Enjoy me. Enjoy your weekend with them and happy birthday. So have a good one, guys. Thanks, Greg. We have uh, Jen Edney coming on next. We're going to give a short two to three minute break and then we'll be back up with Jen. So stay tuned for that.